Olá, pessoal do Sou Java! Eu estou falando primeiro em português, né? Mas eu vou daqui a pouco mudar para inglês, ok? Mas sejam bem-vindos para mais uma sessão do Sou Java Talks, ok? Hoje vamos ter aí uma palestra bem legal sobre Open Telemetry e Continuous Feedback. Então eu vou mudar agora para inglês porque eu vou chamar o nosso convidado, ok? Let's switch to English right now. So, hello everyone, welcome to this new Sou Java Talk session so feel free to send us a message in in, in in the comments just to say where are you from where are you are watching us it's, it will be an amazing session today that we are bringing and we are a pleasant to to have an amazing uh cto uh developer as well of course he is a developer to talking about uh open telemetry and continuous feedback he his name is Ro is Honey Dover, so he's he's from CTO from from Digma. So I will bring him and I will let him introduce himself because it's better. Am I right? And let's 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 meet new people. So come on, Honey, come on to the show. Hello, Hi. Honey. <laughs> How's it going? Hi. Great to be oh, here. Thanks for having me. Oh no, it's it's amazing. It's amazing to talk to 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 the, to the people, in, especially because the the this kind of subjects is very interesting. Continuous feedback and open telemetry is is a hype today. So we could uh, talk more about that. It will be amazing to learn more about that thing. And why not to bring uh, uh, someone that that got experience with about that? And probably it will be make the people especially in the Soul Java, uh, it boosts their careers as well, because it, it's very interesting to, to see how those things work. But mm -hmm. let me stop to speak. I will give you uh, an opportunity to introduce yourself and to speak, where are you from, what are we talking about, and so on. Okay, go ahead, Tony. Sounds good. Let me just share my screen so that everybody can see the presentation. Um, and I am here uh, to talk about open telemetry and continuous feedback, which are topics that are very much uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, just a little uh, bit about my background. So um, I've been a developer for over 25 years. Um, however, I kind of kept changing uh, my kind of focus from development and then to product management because I really had to be involved in the hows and whys we were doing things and not just implement. But then I really missed the coding. So I went back to being a developer and then back to being a product manager. And then eventually I kind of started doing all sorts of positions that allowed me to combine the two. Um, and I'm, throughout that time, both as a product management who, manager who was trying to advance the roadmap and as a developer, I was pretty much concerned with how can we improve the dev process. So, and this is something that I think I want you to take away from this talk in general, where lots of people will talk about observability and open telemetry and all of these technologies. And it almost seems like the, the goal is to have observability or to have a nice dashboard. But from my perspective, it was different. I wanted to see how we can use that data to create better software, to have a better development process, to write better code. Um, and some of the findings and things that I've discovered, I wanted to share. And this is kind of uh, some of what prompted uh, this uh, presentation. And to illustrate, I want to tell you, yeah, go ahead. No, no. I, I just, I, I, I'd like to say that I will be, I will be on the backstage. I will just leave it out people in the chat. So feel free to send the questions during the session on the chat. I will bring it to Honey during the session along the way. Don't worry about that, okay? So Honey, sorry to interrupt you. I, I will be back. I, I will be on the backstage. Definitely. Thank you. Maximilian. Go ahead. So to illustrate that point and kind of explain why I got so, uh, why I think observability is so important and why I got so enthusiastic about the concept of continuous feedback. 
I want to tell you a story, a very average story of a very average developer in my team called Bill. And Bill was given a very average task, something that every developer needs to do, which is develop a feature and push it all the way to production. Now, as I mentioned, I used to be a developer for quite a long time. And back in the days, it was very simple. You had to code the feature, then you packaged it up real nicely, maybe created some documentation if you felt like it. Then you took it all the way to the team across the hall, who was called the QA team. Um, they tested it, and they moved it along in the process. And basically, the only time you heard about it again was if they found a bug or if there was an issue in production. But today, of course, things are a bit different. So Bill, being a very, um, uh, very up-to-date developer, um, he knows he needs to write unit tests, and he needs to maybe write for integration tests, sometimes maybe even more. He even knows about the deployment aspects of the feature. So if he created a new service, he knows to update the Helm file or um, write how to deploy a new Lambda function and so on. So all of that are things that he's very much involved in. But what I noticed and where I started thinking more about how, how we're doing development was what happens next. So what happens the minute after Bill deployed into production? So I'm going to ask you for a second, uh, just based on your experience, let's say you're, you're Bill and you're developing that feature. What is the first thing that you do after you deploy to production? Feel free to write it in the chat. So you've heard your... Well, well. On my side, on my side, I I get start to think about monitoring stuff because uh, when we when we create an application, most of the people, or most of the developer think, okay, I got it, it's done, I will put it on the production, but it's just the beginning. <laughs> you need to to keep those things work. Am I right? So uh, that's the reason why I think that next step is operational things you need to monitor the thing if you, if you see if the application is solving the problem if some problems could happen maybe oh the memory utilization is mm -hmm. is happening in a stranger way something like that so oh moisture say says uh check, check the, the logs, logs. check the logs are <laughs> amazing amazing so people in the chat, so feel free to send the message, please. Check the logs for errors. That's kind of like push and pray, right? You, you push the, yeah. the merge for <laughs> and you pray you don't see anything weird in the logs. Cross the fingers and say, okay, it works, it works. Yeah. <laughs> so Take it away. First of all, Maximilian and also uh, the person who just wrote the, the response, you guys are very special because most people don't do anything. And I found that out in my dev teams that I worked in, in different organizations. It's not even that, you know, they're doing monitoring and all of these things are very advanced. I'm even talking about, is my code that I just pushed even running? Is anybody using it? And I was witness to more than one occasion where really meticulously written code was one bad if statement away from actually getting executed. So you pushed your code, nobody's even using it. And you don't know about it. And the reason is that you kind of move on to the next feature. Now, here are the things that I wanted Bill to ask. And I asked him to ask, did your code work well? Did it improve life? for everybody? Did it change anything? Did it cause any regressions? Did it create a bottleneck for other requests? Did it contain any issues around queries that you can discern if you look at what it's doing in production? Um, is anyone using it? Is it breaking any flows uh, in the system in terms of usage? So all sorts of questions that to me seem trivial to 
ask because this is my code. I need to own it. And I kind of expected Bill to do it. But instead, as I mentioned, Bill kind of always found himself moving on to the next task. And this bothered me. Um, it bothered me for many reasons. It seemed to me that um, we were being asked in my team to accelerate, that is deploy faster, right? Continuous deployment. But it was almost like we were throwing features over the fence, but at a higher rate or kind of higher velocity. So we were sending more and more things into production, but there was no learning and no feedback from that. And to be honest, I'm to blame too, because in the days where I wore the hat of the product manager, just like the rest of the organization, I was pretty much biased and minded towards the next feature. So if a developer came to me and said, hey, I'm done with this feature, I didn't tell him, hey, what feedback are you seeing? I told him, what about the next one? I need to move the roadmap, right? So all of us engineers and organizations are very forward leaning. And that contributes to the problem where we have very limited feedback. So if you think about it, when you're writing code, you do have some feedback, not enough. And I'll tell you a little bit about that in a second. You get some feedback from the test, but that's more like uh, true, false, red, green, right? You don't have a lot of qualitative feedback. You don't know if you've improved things or not. You just know that the functional tests are passing. And as a developer, I have almost no feedback from production. Now, I, thinking about that and kind of struggling with this issue for a while, I went back to the basics. And I took this by now very overused diagram. This is from somewhere on the web. It's like the first Im image that uh, pops up if you search for the DevOps loop. And looking at this image, I found something that was a bit odd, a bit off. And I'm kind of inviting you for a second to look at this and tell me what is a bit weird about this diagram. And don't feel bad if you don't see it, because it took me a while to see it myself. I didn't see it on the first time as well. So, yeah, Maximilian, you have a clue? <laughs> uh, what, uh, what is, uh, uh, what, uh, I think that this, this, this character on, on a bottle, <laughs> what, what is this right here? Uh, Wally, what is Wally is, is doing here? I don't no, know. The Wally is just, <laughs> just so that you know, you need to spot something here, but the, <laughs> Waldo, but, um, but what is off about this diagram is that right in the center of it, you see an arrow that says continuous feedback. It's actually going in the opposite direction to continuous integration. That makes sense. Continuous integration takes code into production. Continuous feedback is supposed to get learnings from production back into the code. But there, amazing, there, are, no, <laughs> there are no tools. There is Salesforce there for some reason, and I've been talking about it so long, I really wish I would find the author of this um, diagram to ask why he decided to put Salesforce there. You could look at other diagrams, and they're all equally kind of lacking in the continuous feedback section. And this really struck me because I thought, well, of course, if we don't have continuous feedback, if all we're doing if as an organization, as developers, we're only looking at the next thing, and we don't have the maturity of toolings to get feedback about our code, then that's a problem. Then that creates that uh, feeling of throwing features over the fence, right? And I thought to myself, having talked to Bob about it, well, if only you had access to objective data about the code, if only it was instant, if only you could look at any piece of code or any area of the application and just be able to, to get data about it. And this is a perfect seg segue to talk about open telemetry and why it's important. So just 
in terms of like a quick census, how many people here are familiar with open telemetry? Just do a plus one on the chat if you're familiar with it. Not a lot, I see. Um, maybe maybe the people uh, are shining yet. <laughs> no worries, no worries. <laughs> Yeah, I see some people here are definitely familiar with open telemetry. And open telemetry is a very big thing in the world of observability and getting information about your code. And the reason open telemetry is important is first of all, first and foremost, not because it's some sort of a groundbreaking technology yeah, and I see here quite a lot of people actually are familiar with open telemetry, which is great. But the, the reason open telemetry is so important is simply because everybody agrees on it. So this never happened before. So instead of having a lot of these closed standards and proprietary standards by different APMs or uh, you know different companies, Instead of that, we kind of get that um, agreement that there is one way or one common way to collect data about the code. And it also includes multiple standards. It includes tracing, logging, and metrics. And that just means from an end user perspective that there is also a very large support coverage for it. And for me as a developer, what that means is that if I'm Bill and I need to now get information about my code, I don't need to start embarking on this project of I need to get information, I need to find observability, how do I enable this, how do I enable that. With Java in particular, the journey can start with enabling a single environment variable, and that's it. And basically, I'm starting to collect a lot of data. So this kind of solves the problem, right? And what can I do with this data? What can I do with the open telemetry data? So one type of data that I'm going to talk about is tracing. So how many of you are familiar with tracing? Just in case, I'll cover the basics. Um, a trace is essentially a flow that occurs within the application. It can, cover, it can cover multiple microservices because it's a distributed trace. And it essentially tells me the anatomy of what happened. For example, in this, we're going to look at some code in a sec. And in this example, I've selected the Pet Clinic app, which is kind of the standard Spring Boot uh, application for kind of a sample app. And in here, you can see that when I um, call the get owners API, it calls Java Spring. It then might have a call to Hibernate or to the database. I added um, um, an external call to an API as well to make it interesting. So that occurred as well. And that constitutes the trace or the things that happen. And the trace can be broken down to different spans or activities so that as a developer, as Bob, Bill, I can actually look at the action that I just ran locally or look at a recording of it in production. And I can understand what are the different sections, how much time each of the activities takes, and understand if there are any issues or errors or any patterns that are related to that specific request. It's a great way, especially around complex applications, to understand what the code is doing. Now, the good news is that to get to this information, to start seeing this in real life, I don't need to do much. So there are multiple ways to activate open telemetry. The simplest one, especially in dev, would be to use the open telemetry agent. And I'll show you how to do that in a sec. Uh, Micrometer also has great support for it uh, if you're using uh, uh, Spring Boot. So definitely check that out as well. 
But once you enable it, most of these libraries and platforms, because everybody agrees on open telemetry, as we said before, they'll already start sending out data. So you'll get data from Spring, from JDBC, from the HTTP libraries, everything, or you know, if you're using Kafka, if you're using Rabbit, all of the different satellite libraries that you're using will start already sending out data without having to change a single thing. And this is what it looks hey, like. Hon hey, Honey, uh, we, got, we got some comments on the chat. <laughs> Yuri Santana said that uh, Tracy is, uh, he thinks that, uh, that it's more related to Arduino or sensor, but it's, it's more about-, it's about it's, actually, uh, it's actually very much uh, a business of enterprise applications. So yeah. for example, here we can actually see, and we'll take a look in a sec more closely, uh, we can actually see what the get operation for a specific owner entails. And some of these were automatically populated just by enabling open telemetry. So the metaphor that's important to keep in mind is that open telemetry, it's like flipping a light switch on. Because once you do it, you start seeing the information that's already there. Um, and that's extremely important, especially uh, meaningful is the fact that it's very, very easy. So just to illustrate uh, the above steps from the open telemetry documentation are everything that needs to happen for you to instrument a Java app. Basically, set a, uh, download the agent, set an environment variable that tells you where it is, select a name for the service and or the, the microservice or application that you're running, and then run your application. That's it. And I'll show you in a sec how to do it in the IDE. It's very simple. At the same time, if you want to start capturing information about a specific function, um, there are great annotations that ha that let you do it. With Open Telemetry, it's with span. There is also the micrometer way of doing it, which is an observe annotation. But it's very simple. It's basically just adding annotations where you want more information, and immediately you can see that data. So with that, I think it's important to try to understand why we're doing all of that. And to do that, I want to tell you a story about a different developer in the team. This is not Bill. This is a different developer in the same team that I caught doing something very interesting. So Bill actually chose to add a log message to the background service he was working on. He decided that he wants to print out how long each iteration of the background service took. So we added some logging messages. And we were all kind of annoyed by the fact that he was spamming everybody with a lot of log messages about timings and things like that. But I chose to, to, take a, to look at the same situation differently. I thought this was a developer who, unlike everybody else in the team, actually wanted to check how the code works. He wanted to validate that as he was adding functionality, he didn't change anything, in this case, in the performance of the code. The only thing he is, and I definitely consider that to be you know, an amazing developer and an amazing initiative that shows ownership, but the only thing that was missing was that he was using the wrong tooling in order to do that. And this is where I also thought about the fact that it's not always a linear process. Like we're thinking about it sometimes in a very, like a straight line, basically. I code, I deploy, I um, check production to get metrics, I get information about the code, I move on to the next feature. But remember, coding is continuous. <laughs> So essentially, when I even start coding, I already have a lot of data. And that developer took two types of data. He said, one thing I want to know is I want to, to have some baseline about how much this operation takes now. And this is something I could have gotten or I want to start with. And then as I'm developing, even before I deploy to production, I want to see changes in that and understand if I made a mistake or if I need to know that I changed the scale of uh, time that this operation takes. 
And then when I move to production, I can continue to monitor, but it's kind of a continuous process. It's kind of like thinking about the paradigm differently. Instead of de developing, deploying, checking, you, you can kind of use the data all the time. And I want to really dedicate the rest of this talk, and I think this is what I kind of prefixed with as well, to the most important topic, which is not open telemetry and tracing in general. And I'm sure everybody just by looking up online will be able to find lots and lots of tutorials about how to enable open telemetry. And I guess this area is well covered, but instead, as I mentioned earlier, I'm more interested in how can we actually use open telemetry to improve ourselves as a developers? How can we use observability to write better code, to detect issues earlier? And to do that, I'm going to talk about several OSS toolings. Um, I'm going to first show you some, and everything I'll show in this presentation is either open source or free. And I'm going to start by showing you some examples using common tools about just how easy it is to start tracking what my application does and how easy it is to check that data, validate it. And then we'll talk about kind of some of the issues that are still preventing developers from actually using this in practice. So with that, um, I think enough slideware and let's pull out uh, my IDE. And over here, I have the pet clinic uh, application that we've discussed. And I took a small project upon myself. Um, hey, honey. Yeah. Honey, sorry to, to interrupt you. Could you, could you increase the, 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 oh, the size sure. of the letters and something? Because it's, it's so. Yeah. <laughs> I hope it's better. I, I, I'm not wearing glasses, but I. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, but, is it better it's now? hard to read it. <laughs> it's better, it's better, thanks. Okay, good, good. Um, so in order to make things a bit more interesting, I thought, well, yeah, the pet clinic example, everybody knows it's kind of very, it's also already done, right? Some people already coded it. So I thought to myself, I'm going to be that developer who's adding a new feature for a second. And the feature I decided to include in my code is, well, each pet must have some kind of a vaccination record, right? So why don't I create some sort of integration with the vaccination API? So of course I had to create some mock-up API in order to, because I'm not going to connect to actual vaccination records. I probably don't have the right permissions. And then integrate that as a component in the pet clinic app in multiple ways. First, when somebody adds a new um, pet into the system, I want to log that and um, check that pet's vaccination status, fetch if he has any uh, up-to-date vaccinations. And then the other feature I thought would be interesting to add was when I'm looking at a specific owner, let me know if um, his pet is overdue for a vaccine. So overall, sounds pretty straightforward. And I was using uh, some code uh, that could have been written earlier. In this case, I just uh, whipped up some uh, Spring component uh, that allows me to basically uh, contact the API, retrieve using basic HTTP, the vaccinations, either all of them or a specific record. Um, and I created a domain service as well that allows me to uh, basically use that API in order to uh, get for the specific group of pets their vaccination records and update uh, their vaccination date. I also added the right models for a vaccination record and linked it uh, via Hibernate uh, mappings to the um, to the pet class. So everything was uh, pretty much, I had a long flight to do it. So um, I managed to get everything done and I'm ready to push into production, right? 
but what do I know about my code and how it works? Now, I was, I was lucky enough to enable OpenTelemetry as I was coding it. And that means that I already have a lot of data. There's a lot of data from before I was writing the feature, and there's a lot of data from after and during the, the time that I was writing the feature. Now, what are the chances that I can actually use this to give myself an extra layer of validation before I actually release this feature? And what are the type of insights that I can actually get about my coding, about different issues that I may have introduced to save me the kind of different issues I might be facing if the, the issues are discovered later. So imagine somebody discovers it during pull, uh, code review. I'll have to wait, introduce the changes, maybe have a bad merge later with some other people who are also changing the code base. Imagine it's detected in tests. I'll need, again, to, uh, or maybe in some daily tests or integration tests, I'll need to retract my commit. I'll, th there's a lot of slowness that will be introduced into the process, just handling the bureaucracy of dealing with rolling this back. And imagine this is discovered in production. And I have a confession. What, back in the days, I was actually... Um, working in a team and we were, as I mentioned before, accelerating the uh, uh, deployment. All we were concerned about is shipping faster. And at a certain point of time, we were just getting a lot of rejects from production via alerts, monitoring, all of that stuff. And that's when I coined in my team the phrase BDD. And I'm not talking about behavior-driven development that you may be familiar with. I'm talking about bug-driven development because essentially that's all we were doing. We were being very reactive. We kept hitting bugs and then we solved them, hitting bugs and then we solved them. And 70% of everything we developed was just bug-related. So my goal is to turn this pyramid on, on its head and say, wait, let's not be reactive. Wait until issues start surfacing and then react to them. We want to do something different as developers. We want to be proactive and actually get that information earlier as we're writing the code to improve it and not just create issues. And then it will be fire brigade mode scurrying to fix bugs in the middle of the night. So let's see what the two links can do to help me do that. So the first thing I did was I linked this up to Prometheus, which is an open source platform for collecting the data. And I also use Grafana, the open source version running locally, to give me some basic information about um, what it means to create a new pet in terms of performance. Try to make this a little bigger. I don't know if it will work. Uh, not so much. But hopefully you can kind of see at least some of it. And basically what I noticed is two things. First of all, I had to create this on my own because all of the graphs that are available out of the out of the box spring dashboard were, as you can imagine, not really developer facing. They were all talking about heap size and CPU and things that are great when you're monitoring production environments, but not if you want to create continuous feedback on what you were doing. So I went ahead and enabled metrics in my Spring Boot application. I'm not going to go into the hows because, as I mentioned, there are lots of documentation about how to enable open telemetry metrics and so on. I use Micrometer and the Actuator. And it was extremely easy to connect this up to Grafana. I can actually link uh, some my stack if you want to see how I did that. And this gave me some sort of a perspective about how the application uh, f functions in terms of performance, which is kind of one uh, dimension that we want to look at. And immediately I saw that I can expect anything be between 80 uh, millisecond at the worst and maybe just about, about a little um, below 20 milliseconds with most of the calls being around 
uh, 20 milliseconds. So this is just uh, from an exercise that I did before this session. So a few challenges here, right? First of all, what do I do with all of these dots, right? They don't form up a straight line because sometimes the machine is busy, sometimes it's doing something else, sometimes it's the first time, so there is uh, a lot of things going on that may incur additional performance cost. But at least visually, manually, I can look at this and have some sort of proportion about the operation that I just changed before my changes, which is creating a new pet. Now, I actually toyed a little bit with the new API that I created, and I did notice some slowness, but I kind of dismissed it. I didn't know if it was that significant. So I was still ready to push my changes. Um, let, let's do that now. So let me uh, go to a specific owner and add a new patch. And as you can see, it is taking some time, but it's very easy to miss. But let's take a look at what these metrics are telling us. And these are very basic metrics. I'm looking at the server uh, HTTP request time, uh, basically, uh, that I'm getting from uh, the Spring um, metrics. So these are out of the box. I didn't add anything. As I mentioned, a lot of the experience you'll see is that all of these are out of the box. So I was just filtering to a particular time before. Um, let me just look at maybe the last three hours should be OK. So <laughs> I guess you can all see the difference. <laughs> this is when I started rolling in my changes and, and as I was debugging. And this is after all of my changes were in. <laughs> so <laughs> there is a definite issue, right? And Granted, in this naive example, it's obvious, like, of course, things are much slower. But don't underestimate the fact that it's very easy to miss, especially if you're not thinking about that particular component or a specific issue that you may have caused. And this gets more tricky if you're talking about asynchronous workflows or things where you're not, if you're not measuring them, you're not always feeling them from a user experience perspective. But this is very quantitative, so it's great. Maybe performance that would, if I have enough, would have kind of caught this earlier on, maybe not. But let's talk about exactly what happened when I introduced my code changes. And here is where we can leverage another great open source tool called Jaeger. And Jaeger is a great platform for visualizing traces. Now, I've connected Jaeger here as well. And by the way, just um, so you kind of have um, a visualization of that, all I needed to do um, in order to enable all of this uh, telemetry and so on was just add a few environment variables. In this case, I added Java tool options with the open telemetry agent. Um, I specified the service name, and basically that's it. And it started working and outputting uh, different types of data and so on. Now let's see if I can get Jaeger up and running. So this is the spring. Just one second. Yeah, Jaeger was down. OK, let's try it again. So yep, so here we have Jaeger and the Jaeger UI. And I'm just going to do this operation one more time of adding a new pet because it wasn't up. And what I'm expecting to see here in a sec um, in the Jaeger UI is I'm actually going to see a visualization of that specific operation. And I can choose the one that I'm interested in. And this is basically the post request. Oops, sorry. Uh, that's basically the post request. Let's see. Yep. 
to creating a new tab, a new pet. Okay, <laughs> this looks a bit different, doesn't it? Um, so let's uh, let's take a look. Uh, here, the uh, it finished uh, running that uh, specific flow, and we can see it here. First of all, we're noticing there's a lot of errors we didn't actually see before, right? Everything was functioning, so maybe these are handled, but it's still interesting to know. And second, and I'll make this a little bigger, we can actually see exactly what went on during that request, where the time went to. And immediately we can see there are a lot of issues here. First of all, that I've introduced in my changes that I was very confident about. So we can see there are way too many selects. We'll get, that in, uh, we'll get into that in a sec, but it looks like an M plus one problem from the Hibernate side. Um, we can see that there are a lot of GET requests, a lot of GET requests to my API. It's actually, it seems to be iterating over many, 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 many requests and also hitting some errors, probably around throttling for some of them. So as you can see, there are a lot of patterns now, and these are no longer just quantitative. These are qualitative. These are things that we can actually study and understand about our code just by looking at the traces and understanding and finding different patterns in what we see there. So maybe it's a good idea to um, check another thing. So I've, as I mentioned, I also added a way to see if somebody needs a fresh vaccination. So let me check that specific owner. And as you can see, I added a needs vaccine field that I can see if, if his pets needs to be vaccinated. And I can take a look at that specific call. I think I should just see it in the recent ones. Yeah, this is for getting a specific owner ID. And again, I'm noticing the problem with the selects, which is interesting. Um, so there are a lot of selections here, but I'm noticing something else that is a bit off that should be familiar for everybody who's using Spring and Hibernate. And that's, it looks like queries are being executed during rendering, which is usually a major anti-pattern. You do not want, it's called the session and view, and it's kind of very not recommended. And I would have completely missed it had I not looked at the trace. So as you can see, just by starting up some basic containers, all of these are OSS, adding an environment variable to, um, to my app so that it knows to use the agent in this case. You can also use micrometer, and especially if you're running in production or testing. I'm able to get a lot of data. So going back to kind of the, the previous topic that we discussed, it looks like problem solved, right? It looks like, you know, we said we needed the data about my code. We need to get feedback. I can get feedback. Open telemetry is here. Open source tooling are here. Why isn't everyone using it? Why is everyone not on the open on, on the continuous feedback wagon yet? And again, I'll be very happy to hear your thoughts on that. Hey, honey, maybe the most of developers think that this kind of technology is so hard to learn it. <laughs> and, and maybe they just uh, underestimate mm -hmm. how powerful it is the continuous feedback. <laughs> that That's one thing, for sure. Any other ideas from the audience? Like, why are you guys not doing this right now? But why you guys are thinking, let me tell you what I found out. So there are a couple of reasons. One of them is expertise. So everything I showed you was pretty simple working with very specific data. But remember, when we look at the graph, it was kind of like a scatter chart with lots of outliers and anomalies. 
Um, culture, yes. L Louis said culture, and that's a really, really important comment. It has to do with comfort zone. It has to do with responsibilities that people foresee. A lot of time people think, whoa, I'm going to just generate more bad work for myself. And why do I want to stick my head in, in this? And maybe it will create some issues. Lots of tools as well. Yeah, it's, it's kind of very hard to get started. And sometimes to get to meaningful results, if you don't want to kind of go down a rabbit hole each time you find something until you figure out if it's a thing or not, you might end up spending a lot of energy for nothing, or you might need to refresh yourselves on a lot of statistics and quantiles and regressions and understanding how to remove outliers and basically a lot of different activities that people don't necessarily do on a day-to-day -day basic and that require some, uh, some expertise that not every developer has or that's outside of their comfort zone. It's definitely outside of my comfort zone. I wasn't such a big uh, uh, statistics uh, expert even in college and having to go back to it during uh, development sounds like punishment. The other aspect has to do with context switching. Um, yeah, and, and Lou, you're right. Deliver is prioritized over maintenance. That's, that's true. Um, and, and definitely contributes to the culture. And again, I was a part of it as a product manager. The other thing has to do with the lots of tools, context switching. I'm, you know, I'm in the IDE now. Then I have to check Grafana. Then I need to check uh, Jaeger. Then I need to cross-relate them. It's very exhausting. But then I think the single most important reason and think back to the days of testing, because you know I was there when we started testing in my organization. And in the beginning, it was not automatic. It was not continuous. We kind of depended on every developer to run tests before they check in out of their kindness of their heart. Nobody did it. And always, if you were the one who pulled the short straw and was the one that had to do it, then you would get stuck with everybody's issues because the tests would, were not running for a week and nobody knew. So unless feedback about the code is continuous, doesn't require expertise, doesn't require manual work, and doesn't require context switching, nobody's going to use it. And this is what I've seen in my team. So I've introduced the toolings. I gave everybody access to it. I told Bill, look, here's your code. Here's what you need to check. And he said it, the, he checked it the first time, he checked it the second time, the third time he thought he found something, but then he looked at it and it was nothing and it took him a day to figure out that it was nothing and it was a false alarm. By the way, same thing happen, is happening with performance testing and things like that. And he gave it up. Just gave it up. And this is where my personal story with continuous feedback started. This is why I became so, um, so passionate and so kind of obsessive about it because the gap seemed unacceptable, unacceptable to me. It, it, it seemed unacceptable that we would have so much data that we would be making such great leaps with observability on the one hand. And on the other end, it was so difficult to actually use that data during development. And everybody was still thinking just about monitoring and how to deal with bugs when they happened and so on. And my thought was, I'm, I, I do not want teams to do BDD. I want teams to be able to use this data, to use this amazing work by the community, these amazing technologies during development. So how can we imagine that continuous feedback line in the DevOps loop having more tools attached to it? So luckily, I'm not the only one. There's a lot of shift in the industry towards making sure developers have more access to assess their code using machine learning and other technologies. If you think about it, we don't just need machine learning to generate code. And I was just doing a lot of work using ChatGPT on regexes and things like that. We also need to use machine learning to assess code, to evaluate code. And this could solve many of the issues that you saw before. And this is what prompted me to create Digma. And I want to demonstrate Digma to you just as a vision in terms of where I think that this could go, what I think continuous feedback 
could be like in terms of changing the paradigm of how we write code in terms of getting more code ownership and being able to do more as developers that also allows us to shine. So think about the developer I mentioned who added the console log message. And I was kind of impressed, but also kind of annoyed at the same time. Think about if a developer in the team suddenly stepped up with something like this. So before I talk about Digma and the beta program, I just want to show you what it looks like because Digma is very easy to show. And I'm going to use the same uh, code that we were looking at before. So Digma is an IDE plugin. It's free, as I mentioned. It's running locally as well, so there is no uh, concern about sharing data or anything like that. Um, and you can simply install it from the marketplace. So I'm just going to look uh, for Digma and install it here locally in the IDE. Let's restart the IDE. And let's see what we can figure out about this code, understanding that what we did before was really not something that's sustainable. I cannot go check dashboards, look for trying to spot uh, different issues each time. That, that, that's not going to work. So let's look at that. Let's start by looking at that same pet controller we were looking at before, only this time, let's try to understand what we can learn about what we were doing automatically. And immediately here, I can kind of see the different uh, actions uh, that I was taking. I can see, for example, the post command for creating a new pet. So let's go in there. I just a second, I'll, I'll also make it a little bigger for you. And immediately you can see I'm looking at the same code, but I don't need to check anywhere. Somebody has already, sorry, I'm making it big, so I'm trying to create some real estate for you there. So somebody already did the work of analyzing how this code performed. And all of these issues that I was expected to manually spot are just here. So just by looking at the code, I can see that there is an M plus one issue suspected and there are excessive HTTP calls as we saw, that was a problem. It was a very chatty API. And I can hey, also- Hey, Honey. Yeah. Honey, could you, could you, have you tried to use the presentation mode? Maybe it will be, make easier to everyone to, to, to watch your screen. Oh, like a uh, full screen? Uh, yes. Uh, no, uh, go to the pre to appearance and try to select the presentation mode. Go to where? Go Sorry. to the view, 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 appearance. Appearance, yeah. Okay. Got appearance and presentation mode. Enterprise. I think, yeah. yeah. That, that's, a good, that's a good trick. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> amazing. Yeah, but I, I'm actually going to to need the, to see the rest of the Oh my God, I did I, a I mistake. <laughs> um, anyway. So immediately, go back, go back if you want. Okay, I, I go back if you want. Okay, I'll go. I'll go back in a sec. But essentially, what did I do? I installed the plugin. The plugin has this uh, process, and uh, it installs Digma locally, so that it's not sending my data to the cloud. And all it's doing is it's using machine learning and statistics and data science and other uh, methods to find out issues about my code. And immediately, I can see a lot of things here. If I click this M plus one suspected, I can see different insights. So I can see that, yes, there is a suspected M plus one. This is how many times it's repeating uh, in median, which is a lot. There is an excessive API calls to my mock API. And here is the slowdown that was detected when I started coding this one hour ago. So again, no need to keep track of a log. It's it's all there just by analyzing it. And I can see where the time and the request is going. Now, excuse me, I'm going to exit the presentation mode for a second so I can show more things. Um, That's OK. Uh, Sorry to, yeah. to, <laughs> to borrow you with that. <laughs> it's actually a good tip, but uh, it it's also hides away parts of the interface. Um, so uh, as you can see, it's, it's immediately uh, easy to see what's going on without going and checking a dashboard. And if I'm interested in that 
or in a specific area of the code, let's say this n plus one issue. Um, so I can just click it and I can just kind of transition to that specific area, see what's going on with it. I can go to that place in the code where it's being called, which is here. I can also see that it's slowing down. I can see who's using it or which endpoints are being affected by it. I can see where the time is going. And if I want to see more, if I want to see what that actually looks like, I can also click the trace button. And sorry, I, I, I forgot to configure it on my machine before, but what it does, it will show me that same Jaeger trace that we saw before, only this time showing that specific issue for me. So instead of looking around Jaeger, searching for traces, I can see it right away, right here in the IDE. And if I want to track exactly how this code is using, I can use the live view and actually have particular insights about this specific piece of code where I can see exactly how it's behaving, what's the top 5%, what's the fastest as it's going and how it transitioned about the time where I started developing it. And I can see that their slowdown is being detected. And in the same way, if I go over to that other um, um, issue that we saw before, we can see Digma already spotted the session in view. I can make this a bit bigger. The session in view issue, where it was actually doing the query during rendering. And again, here we can see, yes, that we also saw suspected M plus one. We see the slowdown. And we see there was another anti-pattern that is detected and we can go again straight to the trace. My bad, I'm not configuring my Jaeger before, but it just works out of the box. Usually if I was not in dev mode, you would not even have to configure that. And the last thing, and this is why I think everybody should be trying Digma right now, is that I don't even need to know open telemetry in order to do that. So one thing that we've introduced with Digma in cooperation with a lot of teams in the Java, world that are working on some of the platforms is just a toggle button for observability. So instead of downloading the Java agent, configuring environment variables, all of that hustle, you install Digma and you just click a button. And here again, I was trying to get developers to use it because developers, as you mentioned, it sounds complicated. I don't know about it. I am, um, I, I'm not familiar with open telemetry. Maybe my project is not ready. Maybe it's a DevOps issue. No, we, we actually don't care that it's open telemetry behind the scenes. It's just a detail in how we watch the code. So it works with Quarkus, it works with Spring. All I need to do is just click observability and that's it. For Quarkus, it will use the OTEL extension. For Spring, it will uh, use the agent. We're going to add micrometer as another strategy soon so you can configure it. And basically that's it. I want to start monitoring my code in, as I run and debug it, I just flip the switch. And as I get more data from more environment, Sigma is just a receiver for open telemetry. So as I get observability working in my organization, I might want to take test environments or production environments and start looking at information from there as well. So looking here at my test environment, I can already see there is a, a big issue around uh, one of the functions. So I can transition there and see what's going on there. Um, and immediately I see I have a scaling issue around my code. Again, this is code that I pushed and the tests were running on it. And you know, I, I was actually doing a webinar with um, um, BlazeMeter uh, a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things that they mentioned, you know, the problems today are different. And this is really the same thing as everything I was just talking about. They said, the problem is no longer, now that there are such great frameworks and platforms for running tests about, the problem isn't generating tests or executing tests. Everybody can do that very easily. It's how to interpret the results. And what happens, the same thing with organizations that start to use observability. They generate so much noise that Either the test keeps breaking because you set the threshold and then it's not met and then it's an outlier and then you're not sure. So either you keep increasing the threshold or at some point some organization just ignore the test, right? Problem solved. Let's delete the test and then the build is green again. And we add a technical that item to add it in the future and everybody forgets about it. So their problem as well, and this is where we saw a lot of value in our joint proposition was 
how do we interpret the results? And here I was running some performance testing script. And I can already see that this area is scaling badly. And this is by interpreting the data, not one trace, not one metric, but aggregating all of them. And I can go see what, what's going on there. And um, I don't know if I can make this bigger. I'm not sure how to control each part of the IDE and its zoom level. But basically what it says, it found a scaling issue. At around uh, thir it, it tested around 30 uh, concurrent calls. The duration varied from five seconds to 183 seconds. So yes, quite the issue when run concurrently. But it was also able to identify the root cause, which is validate owner with external service. And again, I can see a trace of what it looks like, and I can see a histogram where I can actually see this is the concurrency level, this is the time, this is where the bad scaling starts happening. And here we can see how much that specific validate owner with external service took. And I can again go there and see exactly what's going on with this piece of code. And yes, I can see it's a scaling issue that's affecting this endpoint. And I can understand more about what my system does. So our goal in Digma was to take all of the all of the data that's already there and to try to translate it into something practical, something that won't require that expertise and something that would be very easy to enable for me as a developer right now, just install a plugin, click a button, and already you're monitoring your application. We actually chose to start with a local version and not a cloud version because we know developers care about not sharing observability data from their organization and so on. So we, we wanted to make absolutely sure that that's not an issue. And then we started rolling it out. And the more feedback we got, the better the platform is becoming. So just like we, you can see here things like session and view around plus one, and we're looking at query security issues and other things, our database keeps growing as we hear more examples from users who are telling us, you know what, this specific exception is happening, and, and it means x, y, z, and so on. So we're already taking a lot of data. We decided to focus on Java in particular, on Spring, Quarkus in particular, although we do support micrometer dropways and the rest, because we want to provide much more value for a developer without showing him generic data. I don't want to see a CPU chart. I don't want to see a graph. I want to understand what is the bottom line. And this is what is known as the cognitive gap. So if I need to spend a lot of cognitive effort just to make sense of the data, just to understand what is happening, then I'm less likely to do it. The more cognitive effort I needed to spend, the less likely it's going to happen. So we started off was a problem that there was no data. Then we matured, we got some data, we even got some OSS toolings, but for me as a developer to use them required a lot of effort, cognitive effort, statistics, expertise, and it wasn't continuous. And this is the third step. This, I think, is what is needed in order for every developer to not, not even worry about it, just have this visible and available, just like any other data that they have about their code. And ultimately, it can help me avoid introducing such issues into production, detect them earlier, find them out even before testing, accelerate the dev cycle because I don't need to re-merge it again, catch a lot of escape defects, and continuously optimize my code. I can also go back to my product manager about the technical that and tell him, look, these are the services that are being affected. And this is what is being uh, experienced in the field. So it will help me um, uh, push that agenda as well and maybe help alleviate some of the forward bias that many organizations are having. So with that, I'm going to pause for a second and I'll be very happy to answer any questions. So um, amazing presentation, Honey. Uh, I, I have a question. <laughs> you mentioned that we need to run our application, but it works with uh, in, a, in a test executions as well. With what? For example, if I want to get the feedback, but I don't want to run my application in my dev environment. Yeah, you can also world. run your tests, for example. 
and they will. I, I could it. run my tests and get feedback from there as well because exactly. Okay, great. It's amazing. Oh, we got we got. Oh, you got. Uh, Sir Dana said, uh, "Pretty amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. It, it's good because we could we could learn more about about many things that we." Don't know about it before, of, of course, because I, I've just saw, showing uh, saw your presentation, and I okay open se uh, open session view uh, mm -hmm. issue. I, I know about that, but I never uh, thought I never see some someone tackle this problem on this way. It's very practical way to 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 figure out what's happening, and we, based on that we can. Take it at actions, and we can learn more about that. Probably no ones down here have been talk, talk about that before. So I think it's very valuable. It's amazing one. So so guys in the chat, people in the chat, feel free to send questions to Honey about that. It's amazing kind of way to think about improvement your code, improving your skills as well. Because based on this kind of Tool, you could learn more about concurrence, uh, uh, scaling, scaling, mm -hmm. and um, observability things that it, that that Ron said before. For example, you don't need to to learn more about open telemetry <laughs> technology. You just need to to pay attention with this kind of information. I think it's some so valuable thing. So I and will. Let people me... are thinking about their next question. I just want to mention. Uh, that, first of all, as I mentioned, it's completely free. We will never charge developers. Uh, we don't think developers should pay for dev toolings. Um, we do uh, want you to consider joining our beta. Now, you may be asking, why do why is there a beta if I just show you the product and I can get it from the marketplace? Well, you can, and you're welcome to get it from the marketplace. I think every product should always be in beta. <laughs> And that is because if you're in beta, you're getting feedback. And if you stop getting feedback, then uh, it's, it's, it, it won't work. And I myself have learned a lot of lessons because I started this company thinking, I'm, I'm a developer. I'm writing for a product for developers. Why do I need to get feedback? I know everything. But no, every developer I talked to had a different perspective. And eventually, I was wrong on many of the things I thought I was right at. So, we do have a beta program. And what that beta program means is that you can, it's not listed. You can go there uh, by invite only. And I'm, I'm inviting this group as well as several other groups to join. And basically, if you go to digmaya.beta, there is a, a short questionnaire. And then it will essentially schedule some time with me. Uh, because what we want from the beta users is to use Digma, nothing else but tell us more about their experiences, what they like, what they want to see and they're not seeing, and what they don't like. It, like the best session I had was, and early on we had a developer join and he said, you know what, this is crap, I can't use this. And I'm like, yes, I got some good, some, some feedback I can actually use because until everybody was say, saying only polite things. And then he said, yes, well, I want to look at the errors, but you're just showing me a list. And it's confusing because I have thousands of errors. So find hotspots of errors for me. And so we implemented that. And that was amazing because we kind of, kind of got to see the smile of it on his face afterwards, but also because it got us some real, actual, tangible feedback, which is what we're looking for. So basically, uh, the beta program just means that every now and then you have like a 30 minutes chat with me or a Zoom meeting, whatever you prefer to give me your thoughts and experience. And in addition to that, we're starting a few open source projects around open telemetry and Maven and Gradle and other technologies. So if, if you are part of the beta program, you're also invited to participate and contribute. So again, based on, on, on your availability. Uh, so we'd love to have you use, use the program and we'll also love to have you join the beta. Oh, amazing, amazing. I, I can see, look, uh, Yuri Santana said that it's the first time that he's learning about telemetry. Okay. So it's, <laughs> yeah. it's amazing to me. Yeah. Yeah, because oh, telemetry I, I, is something related to metrics, right? to sensors, right? He's right. But yeah. The, the, it's a completely different thing. Yeah. I, I, I thought, I thought, 
I thought that that it's, it's about uh, yeah. I, I think it's it's amazing to think about uh, cognitive load that we need to have to handle a bunch of tools. So I think that get this kind of tool inside of your IDE, it saves a lot of time. It's very powerful thing. I, I will, I will take a, I will take a try on it. Okay, Donny, <laughs> I just yeah. jo joined there. I need to, I need to book a time with to talk to you. <laughs> I didn't eat yet, but guys, it's a good opportunity to, 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 to test it, to learn more about about the code, to get feedback. Let's give feedback to to Ronnie in order to improve this this amazing tool. <laughs> it it is a continuous feedback am i right <laughs> yeah it's amazing sure. yeah but um, that's it guys so i don't know um if anybody, say something more? if anybody does have additional questions um you can reach me um either on um the um twitter where i am uh, doppelware i can write it down so that everybody has it uh wait a second or maybe you can write okay. it down. Writing it in in the in the private chat. This is kind of my uh, my uh, Twitter handle. You can always reach me at, uh, reach out there. Uh, you can also just reach me out at my uh, um, email address. Uh, so yeah, I'm always happy to talk to Java developers, senior developers, uh, people who who kind of deal with these issues on a daily basis. Uh, because uh, it's always a great conversation to have. So uh, feel free to to reach out. Thank you, everyone. Okay. No, sure. Let, let me just to, to send on the chat. This is the the Honey handle, and uh, let me get let me get the Honey's mail. Hold, hold on. You know, it's it's a new tool, so I need to learn more about it. <laughs> okay, so let me type. This is the on email. So, as he said, feel free to to hit him out, reach 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 out him to talk to him about this this thing and make this is a too amazing as as possible. And all right, so because it's an amazing one, I, I I love it. I love. It. I need to I need to test it. And uh, for sure, but that's it. I don't know. I, I don't know if you got no new, new questions. So I'd like to bring Honey near to me to say thank you again, Ronnie, to to share this valuable content about continuous feedback and observability. And uh, it's more. It's bigger than than that than it. I think. Uh, it's a good opportunity to, to, to open the mind of the people talking about how the way they are treating the code. It's not just write the code and put on a production, bye-bye, see you soon. No, no, it's just the beginning, am I right? So <laughs> just make sure, oh, look, look, the people is saying, is clapping a lot. Yes. Oh, we got, we got a good, good sound, sound effect right here. Hold on, guys. Hold on. I need the uh, honey deserves that. So uh, hold on. Oh God. Why are you turning that? <laughs> okay. While you're finding that, I'm also uh, linking here uh, the um, invite link for our Slack group for our Digma uh, for continuous feedback, actually, in general. And uh, there are lots of people there that are exchanging views, ideas, tools, and resources that they're using. I've, there are links to blog posts that are related to the topic. So uh, join the, the Slack group. I'm there. Uh, all the Digma, Digma team is there, as many of our users are there. So I uh, hope to see you there as well and continue the conversation. Yeah, amazing. So thanks, Honey. I, I'd like to thank you. See you soon in in the future, maybe probably. Uh, we we keep open the so Java 
Jug, open to you if you want to bring more co amazing content like that. Okay. So, oh, looks like the people are saying that they will, they will try, try it. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> it's amazing. Awesome. Okay. So that's it. I don't want to spend more time. Guys, see you soon. So thanks, Honey, again, and see you soon. And next time, guys, bye-bye. Thanks a lot.